Amen. So, here this morning again, this is what's called the Word of God. All the time in the Bible as you read it, uh, you'll hear come across that expression that the prophets said. They would say, the Word of the Lord came to me, and this is what he said. And so you constantly, so in this book, you have... God's word, we call it God's word. And, and I hear people say that all the time. Well, why doesn't God speak to me? Why doesn't God speak to me? Every time you open this book, it's his words and he's speaking to you. I mean, sometimes he does it in a different way, kind of to your heart. and You know he's speaking. But I know that every time we open this word up, he's speaking to our hearts. And Jesus can be found all through the scriptures and in picture and in type. But today we're especially focusing on the resurrection itself, which is an awesome thing. Starting Friday in this last week, kind of going through perhaps many churches going through the uh, Good Friday, what we call, when he died, and today actually celebrating the birth. So I'd like to read kind of a bigger chunk this morning, a bigger chunk of, of scripture, but starting at uh, in Matthew's Gospel, the 27th verse, or a ch- 27th chapter, I'm sorry. Dealing with the resurrection of Christ. And I, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to read. We're going to finish through the chapter 28, but I think I'll take it in sections and we'll look at it together that way and then comment a little bit on it as we go through it. These are great days, great days to be alive. God has placed us in this generation for a purpose. He knows what he's doing. And I'm thankful that he left us his word. We had not too long ago in church a lady that was tortured for her faith in Christ. And she experienced the presence of the Lord in the cell when they tortured her back in China. And uh, it's neat to know that the God we serve, the God we bow down to and serve is the same God that the disciples worshipped. Isn't that good? Isn't that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is also our God. And he hasn't changed I know in, in Germany when we were there, they called him Opa. They would call him Grandfather God. As though as he's lost his power over time and he's a helpless old man with a cane up there somewhere. But he hasn't lost his power. He's the same yesterday, the Bible says, today and forever. And so let's look at the passage. Let's begin at verse 57. I could read a lot, but I want to kind of pick up after his death. Christ has died now. He's on, been on the cross uh, to make sure he was dead, the, the soldiers went up and pierced his side and water and blood flew, f- fled or flowed from his side. Sorry, my English isn't so good. Uh, and uh, then they knew he was really dead. And then Pilate gave permission to take the body down from the cross, from the capital punish, place of capital punishment. And so we pick up the story and it's probably familiar to many of us, but I want to read just from Matthew's account, if you have a chronological Bible, I encourage you to get one. You can kind of read all accounts together and get the full picture of what's happening. But I'm just taking Matthew's account of it here this morning, and we'll look, focus on that. And so beginning at verse 57, Matthew 27 and verse 57. And when evening had come, uh, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. Now, this this Joseph was a a member of the Sanhedrin, and it says in another gospel that he did not consent to the Lord's, to what they did to Jesus. He was not in agreement when the Sanhedrin met together and said, let's crucify him, let's crucify him. And so he himself had become a disciple of Jesus. Isn't that neat? Isn't it neat that you and I can become a follower of Jesus Christ even today? Joseph was not, but there came a time in his life where he became a disciple. And that's how it happens to each one of you and me. We don't just automatically are children of God. The Bible says to those who believe in him, to those who receive Jesus, gave he the power to become the sons of God. Isn't it neat that you can become a child of God? And this happened to Joseph. And uh, he was a rich guy here. And uh, now let's see what he's going to do. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth. And he laid it in a new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the tomb. Let me just say this about these women. 
They went and checked out the spot where he lay, the tomb in which Jesus was placed. Here are two women, Mary Magdalene, of whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. And uh, here she is following Jesus right to the end. And after the uh, taken down from the cross, she wanted to see, along with this other Mary, where they were going to lay him. And they found out and they saw the tomb. So they witnessed, they found the right place where it was. And um, then we go on in verse 62. On the next day, uh, which followed the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate and say, saying, Sir, we remember while we were still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say to the people, He is risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. Here are the chief priests. And again, together with Pilate, they said, Hey, this deceiver, that's what they think of Jesus. This deceiver. And there's a lot of, I don't know, what what do you think about Jesus this morning? <laughs> I meet people that think he's God, that know he's God. I meet other people that say he was just a man. I meet other people that just use his word as a curse word every time they stub their toe. That's what that they, all that it means to them is, is just as a filthy curse word when they get angry. But who is Jesus to you? Here. The people, the Pharisees, the religious people, the people who should have known better, the people who had the scriptures, rejected the one who had come to save them. And they rejected him. And they called him a deceiver. But they said he said that after three days he will rise. Isn't it funny that they remembered that? They heard that? Jesus told the disciples that at least three or four times. He said, I'm going down to Jerusalem. I'm going to be... Hand it over, I'm going to be tortured, they're going to kill me, and after three days I'll rise. And none of the disciples really got that in their mind. They said, that can't be, I don't know. But here even the Pharisees somehow heard about it. And so they're coming to Pilate and said, hey, this, this deceiver here, this imposter thinks, says that on the third day he's going to rise. So let's, let's secure the tomb, make sure he doesn't. And Pilate gives him a guard and says, make it as secure as you can. And uh, see, the Pharisees, remember, if you're reading the Bible, there's two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And the difference between the two, and if you read the New Testament, is the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the body. The Sadducees didn't. So you can always remember that because they're sad, you see, right? Sad, you see. And the Pharisees, they believed in the resurrection. And so now they're together and they, they, they know there's a resurrection of the dead, but they don't. They remember that Jesus said that and they came to Pilate to talk about this. And Pilate says, make it as secure as you can. And again, the whole purpose for doing that was in verse 64. His disciples came, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he's risen from the dead and the last deception will be worse than the first. <laughs> you see, you had to get the picture here that Jesus was killed, their master, their Lord, the one they followed for three and a half years. Saw him do these miracles. Saw him heal the sick. Saw him raise the dead. Saw him do all kinds of things. They were amazed at it. Here they're his followers. And now their master and Lord is killed and crucified. And uh, the accusation above his cross was Jesus, king of the Jews. He was a king. And so that would be against Caesar, wouldn't it? That would be a crime against the state. And so now they kill their master. What do you think these guys are doing? They're in hiding. These guys are scared to death. They're in a building. If you read John's Gospel, they're in a building locked away, hiding from people. And so when he said, lest the disciples come and steal his body, believe me, guys, the last thing on the disciples was mind was to go out and steal Jesus' body. They were scared. They were too scared to be doing that. I think they were more scared that somebody was going to come in and steal their body and arrest them and put them to death for being a follower of Christ. So it's quite a, a wild thing. Nevertheless, it was dangerous for them to go out and about. But it, it's amazing to me, these brave women, isn't it? 
The men who seem to be in hiding, but the women seem to go quite freely out there. They want to find out where Jesus is, and they find it out. Joseph of Arimathea, he was not afraid to take the body of Jesus. And here you have the ones who followed him. And Peter himself who said, I will never deny you. You know, even if everybody else does, I'll follow you to the death. And then we have his denials. Where he denied that he even knew the Lord with cursing the third time. He was afraid for his life. And so he's still in hiding along with the other disciples. And so a guard is given a group of soldiers, some say it can be as many as 50 or 60 soldiers to a guard. I don't know how many it is. But anyway, it'd take quite a few if they're afraid somebody's going to come and steal a body, right? So Pilate gives them a guard to make sure that Jesus didn't rise from the dead or to make sure that somebody didn't steal him. Alistair Begg uh, preached a sermon that I heard on this last week on this topic, and he called it an impossible assignment. I love the title. An impossible assignment. These soldiers, think about it. The God who made the heavens and the earth come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ. <laughs> he comes to this earth and they think they're going to stop him from rising from the dead. What a thing. An impossible assignment. Uh, did they actually think he was going to stop the resurrection? I think he said in his message, he said, you might as well just go and the dawn before the sun rises, just go to the sun and say stop. And get the whole world to say stop and see if you can stop the sun from, you know, from rising that day. It won't happen any more than this won't. And so we'll continue with the story here in chapter 28 and verses 1 through 4. Now after the Sabbath, at the first day of the week, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Remember, they'd been there the night before, or the on Friday to see the, where the body was laid. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. Hmm. His countenance was, was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Wow. <laughs> What a happening. So as these women are making their way to the grave, all of a sudden there's an earthquake. Now, this is the second earthquake, is it not? In a relatively short time. Back in chapter 27, it says that when Jesus died and gave up the ghost, that the earth shook, the earth trembled. And now, this is another earthquake. Strange things were happening in those days. Strange things. Uh, it says that the the veil in the temple, when Jesus died, not only was it an earthquake, it said, but the t temple, the, the curtain that separated between the Holy of Holies and the other place, the temple curtain, which is several inches thick, ripped right in half from top to bottom. When you wrap it to top to bottom as God did it, saying from, from him to us, and he opened the way into us for us to enter into freely into his presence, into the throne of grace without mediation, and that neat, except for Christ. He comes in. We, what a thing. So that happened. The Bible says that the rock split. I don't know what that was like, but that'd be freaky. Would you think? I mean, Jesus, the earth shakes. The curtain, those that were near the temple or in the temple probably heard that happen. They somehow found out anyway later. But then the rock splitting. Rocks moving around. That's, that'd give me a little jolt, wouldn't it, you <laughs> And so some strange things were happening that day. And there was an earthquake here. Again, the second way. In. But this one, it says, and specifically happened because an angel, a messenger from heaven, came down and he rolled the stone away. At the presence even of an angel, the earthquake trembled. And he rolled back the stone. And it says here in verse 4 that the guards shook for fear of them, of him. And he said that his, his clothing was white. It was like lightning. Don't tell me you wouldn't be a little scared. I mean, think of the, these guys are Roman soldiers. Fight. If you want to put it in our modern day, you just picture a bunch of Marines sitting around a dead man's tomb. Oh, we got an easy night, they would say, huh? Just watch a grave and make sure nobody steals it. Easy job. But man, when that angel came and the earth shook 
and they saw him, they became like dead men. They trembled. I mean, it was bad enough the earth was shaken. And it's almost using the same word in the Greek, the same root word as saying that they trembled, they earthquaked. <laughs> and they began to shake and to tremble. And this is only at the sight of an angel. Remember another time when Jesus was transformed, transfigured before the disciples, Peter, James, and John. Remember that? They went onto the mountain and Jesus was transfigured before them. And they saw Moses and Elijah. And the appearance changed and his face was like the sun and stuff. Hey, that's some stuff you don't see every day. They got to see the glories of another world in this, at this time. And they, it shook these, these brave, strong soldiers who faced battles before and had no, no fear, perhaps. And now they're shaken so much that they're knocked unconscious. They're, they're scared stiff, laying on the ground unconscious at the appearance of this angel who came back to roll a stone away. And I imagine this probably didn't take very long that they were unconscious. I don't know. The Bible really doesn't say they got up, must have seen the body gone, and they're running back to town. We'll read that in a minute. In verse 5, the angel answered and said to the women. So now the, the women come to the grave. I imagine the soldiers are gone by now. I don't know. The women come, and, and the first thing the angel says to them is, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. But the first words they hear from the angel's mouth. And again, they must have been shaken too. these women a little bit. For number one, they didn't expect to see the stone rolled away. That was enough to give them a shot. But then to see an angel sitting there on the stone. And the first thing he says to them is, do not be afraid. You know how many times in the Bible, Jesus has to tell his disciples, don't be afraid. You ever have fear in your life, kids? <laughs> fear of the dark, fear of other things. Fear of the unknown, whatever it is in your life. And yet... We, we taught our kids when they were young, and John hated the hospital. John hated doctors, hated needles especially. And I can remember having that we taught them that verse, when I'm afraid from Psalm, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. It doesn't say in the Bible, if you're afraid, it says when you're afraid. There are going to come times in your life when you are afraid. And we used to let, and then he would quote that verse before we go to the doctors, and we'd make him quote it all the way there, so that when he gets there, <laughs> he'd look to the Lord for his strength and help him get through it. When I am afraid, I will trust you. You're going to have times in your life when you're going to face things you've never faced, and these women are facing something they didn't know how to handle. And aren't you glad there's comfort from heaven saying, don't be afraid? And how often God has to tell us that, but they're words of comfort, aren't they? He's risen. He's not here. In uh, John 20 and verse 19, it says, I'm, I quoted this earlier, told you about it, but that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut or locked, some of the versions say, the, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. And it says that Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. That's in John's account. Later on when he comes and appears before the disciples. But the key here in this verse is that Jesus, or the disciples were locked behind, clo uh, behind closed and locked doors for fear of the Jews. They were afraid for their life. They're afraid and all of a sudden Jesus comes in to the room. How do you explain that? In a resurrected body, he can do what he wants too. Comes into their room, the door's being shut. And you know what I think that says to us? I think that tells us that there's no place in your heart where Jesus can't go, where no other counselor can help you, this one can get to. He'll find his way into your circumstances like nobody else and be able to speak a word to your heart and say peace. You know, that when the disciples heard that word peace be to you or don't be afraid as well, I bet that was just as thrilling as the thief who was dying next to Jesus on the cross and Jesus told him, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Imagine what he felt like after hearing that. If you were a thief in all your life, and all of a sudden, the last moments of death before death, Jesus, you repent of your sins as this man did. 
as he acknowledged Jesus as having done nothing wrong, but he said, I deserve to be here. And he said, remember me when you enter your kingdom. And Jesus said, today, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Do you think that man was a little happy in his dying hour till he's on the cross? What joy, what relief he'd come in. What relief in the midst of the disciples being in a fearful, fear of death. Maybe you haven't faced it like this, but to have Jesus come into your midst and say peace is a wonderful thing. Aren't you glad we have a Savior like this who cares about us enough to say, if you're afraid, hey, don't be afraid. Trust me. Trust me. Cast, what the Bible say? Cast all your cares on me, for he cares for you. Trust me in your circumstances. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Put your confidence in me. And that's what faith is, people. Faith is just simple trust in Jesus. Simply trust him. If Jesus said it, I believe it. It's good enough for me. That's faith. That's trust. That's confidence. Now, if you start to say with anything in the Bible, and you start to say, well, I don't know if it really happened like that. What you're doing is calling God a liar. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. And so he says he's going to do something. And he said that, here, he is risen from the dead as he said. Tell me anything that Jesus didn't say that didn't come true. And what he has yet to come true in prophecy is going to come happen. It's going to happen. I have no doubt about it. And so this is what faith is. And this is what trust in God is. In daily life, you say, well, God doesn't care about me going to work. And he does too. He cares about every little thing happening in your family. He wants you to trust him in that time. He wants you to trust him when you go to work. See, This Christianity isn't just Sunday morning, one hour and a half or two hours together. That's not the church. That's this is that's not trusting God. God is trusting God is Monday morning on your way to work. Trusting him all through the day when you're at your co-workers and working together. God cares about every part of your day. He wants to cast all your cares on him, not just some of them. For he does care for you. He's not here for he's risen, as he said. Imagine the surprise on the women, huh? When that angel said that, what relief, they were scared, but what a relief to hear that, isn't it? He's risen. That's good news. And then he says these words. He says, come and see the place where he lay. Come, you, you women, I, I want you to go in there. I want you to take a peek in there. Look, I want you to be eyewitnesses. There's no body in there. Not saying to God is saying that to us this morning. Take a, take a look in there. I'm risen. I'm not there. And you know, this, maybe you've heard this before, but the angel didn't roll away the stone so that Jesus could come out. Jesus could come out of there with the door of the stone still there. The reason that stone is rolled away is for you and me to look in and to see that he's not, that he's not there. And so, the, I mean, even he- heavenly beings come to this earth to say, hey, come look. Take a peek. Look in here. What do you see? <laughs> what do you see in there? Not much. You know, it's amazing to me how many miles people will travel to go to the grave site of a famous person. I've done it before. I've gone to see, maybe you've heard of Count von Zinzendorf, former East Germany Count. Anyway, his grave is there and I saw it. But There's one who's more famous than anybody and that's Jesus. And to go to his, his tomb that day, He's the only tomb where you're going to go and not find his body, though. He's risen. And the heavenly beings, again, are the ones who say, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Yeah, Jesus was, he's interesting because one of his first followers said, hey, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, well, birds have nests, foxes have holes. But he said, me, the son of man, has no place to lay his head. You want to follow me? Well, I don't know where I'm sleeping tonight. And then later on, when they came time to pay the temple tax, and the people said, hey, doesn't your master pay the tax? Jesus told Peter to go fishing. And the first fish you catch, he said, take money out of its mouth and pay the temple tax for you and me. <laughs> I like Jesus' method here. Uh, then later on, he borrowed boats, didn't he? To preach out of. He said, can I use your boat? And he jumped in the boat and the people on the seashore there and he preached to them. He borrowed a boat. Then as we celebrated Palm Sunday last week, he even borrowed somebody's donkey. Isn't that neat? 
The God who made the heavens and the earth was present. And the Bible says in John 1 that nothing was made without him, without Jesus. And yet he's borrowing people's things and stuff. He wasn't going to be here long, so he just needed it for a little while. And in his death, he said, I, I'm going to stay in a borrowed tomb, too. I'm not going to stay there very long. You can use it again after I'm gone. So what a life he had. Not holding on to anything in this world with a tight grip, just loosely. Just passing through, and you and I are doing the same thing. Be careful that you don't hang on to the things of this world. They're only borrowed to us, even our children are borrowed to us for a little while. And so they go to the tomb. And you know, in that tomb is where my sins have stayed. There's no resurrection of sins forgiven. Aren't you glad of that? The grave is not my final resting place as Bruce talked about this morning as well. Let's go to verse 52 of chapter 27. Another strange thing happened. You can keep your finger there. We'll continue to go on. But I just wanted to read this. You know, it said in the temple, the veil in the temple broke. Here's something else that Bruce kind of referred to in a a little sense. And And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection... They went into the holy city and appeared to many. Talk about weird stuff going on. That's strange things, right? (laughs) I mean, these people, and and they're dead. The Bible uses that language, uh, asleep. But why would they be coming out of the graves if they were, he meant they were dead. Isn't this a little foretaste of what's going to happen at a second coming? When the dead in Christ shall rise first. The resurrection of the body is not that difficult for God. There he conquered death. The last enemy has been conquered. And the gra- they came out of the graves after his resurrection. Isn't that something? Imagine this morning. I mean, we somehow when you read the Bible, you get the idea that these guys uh, were used to this type of thing. They were not. This is written over thousands of years. You got things happening here and then for 400 years, nothing happened. And all of a sudden, God shows up again and things happen. But And they even said, when Jesus healed a man or did something or cast out demons, they said, whoa, we've never seen anything like this before. You know, they kept saying that. And the disciples were amazed at the thing, see? And can you imagine this morning if Audrey Foster walked through those doors right now and sat next to Beth? Mrs. Babcock found out that she was the one put the jelly beans downstairs on the table. It was really Muriel, but that was Mary's job when she was here. And then she came up and sat in here. Dan Pinion walks down the aisle, comes and sits here this morning. What do you think of that? Huh? Let's make it a little more real. This is what happened to him. That'd be a little freaky. <laughs> but it's just a sign of what's coming. Jesus rose from the dead. Some of the saints rose up from the graves too. And they came out and they appeared to people. And people were saying, well, where'd you come from? <laughs> I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us any more than that. But just to give us a picture that, hey, death isn't the end. There's life after death. There's going to be a resurrection. This body is going to decay. I mean, it's already started. Look at this. Nothing up there. But when I get in the grave, worms are going to be. But somehow God's going to raise it all together. The sea gave up. It says in Revelation, the sea gave up the dead that were in them. God's able to do it. If if he made decay and like that, when the body naturally takes care of it, he can bring it all together again somehow. A resurrected body. Strange things happening that day. But it shows me that he's got victory over death. You see, if Jesus stayed dead, then our sal- we would be still in our sins. Read for homework if you want. Bruce read out of 1 Corinthians 15, but read that whole chapter. You want something about the glorious resurrection, what's going to happen to our bodies after that. Read that chapter as your homework. 1 Corinthians 15. It's an awesome chapter. And in that chapter, it says that he... He was seen, Jesus was seen of over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain with to this present day, but some have fallen asleep. In other words, some of them have died. But out of those 500 people, when Matthew wrote this gospel, he says most of them are still alive today. They saw Jesus at one time. 500 people saw the resurrected Jesus. First, he says he appeared to Mary Magdalene, and then to the disciples, and then, but he appeared to 500 at once, proving he'd risen from the dead again. And so, in verse 8, let's go back to Romans, or 
while you're there too. It says he was, again, the reason Jesus rose from the dead in Romans 4.25, it says he was delivered up because of our offenses. In other words, the reason he was hanging on the cross is because of the offenses that you and I did, the sins that we did. Every time you lied, that was a nail in his hands. I caused his death. He was delivered over for our offenses, but he was raised for our justification. Where God, we talked about that last week, where God says, looks at you and says, you're righteous in my eyes. What a privilege to have our sins forgiven like that. And that's what he did when he raised him from the dead. On verse 8 of chapter 28, I'll hurry along here. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee and there they will see me. As they were being obedient to do what the angel told them to do, Jesus met them. You know, it's like to me, I, I read this account and I was like, Jesus just couldn't wait. He just couldn't wait to reveal himself. And it's that way with you too. He can't wait to reveal himself to you. But he, he needs people willing. He comes and he meets with these people. They fall down. What's the first thing they do? They don't take his name in vain. They worship him. When's the last time you bowed down before Jesus, before God Almighty? And just worshipped him. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Same word the angel said, don't be afraid. Calms their fears again. Verse 11. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guards, we're going back to the guard story again. Some of the guard came to the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and, and uh, consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them the disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if it comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. The day, as Matthew wrote, people that still that rumor was about because these soldiers spread it. I mean, you have up to 50, 60 soldiers spreading rumors. But they knew he was, isn't it interesting? They put these guards there to make sure that nobody would steal the body, to stop the resurrection, as it were. And God uses those same guards to go back to tell the, the chief priests, he's risen. He's risen. This is what happened. An angel came. He rolled the stone away. We were knocked unconscious. Jesus' body is no longer there. And they paid him a large sum of money. I mean, you'd have to pay a large sum of money, wouldn't you? I mean, imagine today a Marine telling his commander and stuff, uh, I put you on duty to guard something over there. Uh, what'd you do? I fell asleep. You think there'd be some, I mean, you'd get actually your head chopped off in these days for that and that. But they said, they said, listen, tell people you're asleep. Oh, I could never tell anybody that. We'll give you this much money. And all of a sudden their eyebrows raised and said, wow. Well, I take the humiliation of saying I fell asleep for that much money. I'll say anything. They gave him a large sum of, and the, the word for it is silver there. Large sum of silver. Imagine this. Judas comes in and they, he betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Rather little bit. He betrays Jesus for money. And yet, now here a few days later, they're paying a large sum of silver just to spread the rumor that Jesus, it's amazing to me how much time and money people will spend to try to disprove God. So the Jews put a guard. They were supposed to stop him and it didn't work. The Jew, those, decide, those soldiers knew what happened. They took it to their deathbed if they could hold in. I don't know if they could all hold it out or not. You know, see, people, it isn't lack of evidence that people have. God, just show yourself to me and I'll believe. That doesn't work. Even Jesus said that. When he's telling the story about that rich man and Lazarus and the rich man went to hell, he said, that rich man is begging Abraham, send, send Lazarus back from the dead. If you raise him back from the dead, I have five brothers. 
I, I don't want to the, them to come. He's in hell, and so he's crying out in torment. He says, listen, I don't want my five brothers to come to this place of torment. He says, please, let Lazarus, the poor man that begged at his, at his, at his gates, he said, let him rise from the dead. Tell my brothers so that they don't come to this place of, of, of torment, he said. And he said, if they see Lazarus from the dead, rise from the dead, they will repent, he said. So he knew what kept him out of hell, repentance. He knew that, but it was too late for him, but he's worried about his brothers. See, we always worry about where our relatives are today that are dead. No, the Bible tells the opposite. The ones who are in hell are worried about when the ones who are alive, so they don't come to this place of torment. And they beg Abraham, send something. And what's the answer? The answer to that is no, they will not believe even if somebody rises from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead. Did, did these soldiers believe? They refused. They'd rather believe a lie than the truth. We've been talking through, through the book of Romans. Amazing. It's not for lack of evidence. Remember the people that bond around the cross, they, they cried out, Ah, oh, Jesus, come down, save yourself. Come down from the cross and we'll believe in you. No. He had to pay the penalty for your sin and mine. God's a just God, and so he took it out on Jesus. So there would be the possibility of forgiveness. It's an awesome thing. So it's not for lack of evidence. And there's a verse in Mark that says this, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? In this case, silver. These soldiers traded their soul for silver, the salvation of their soul for a lie, for temporal pleasures that the money would, their pleasures would last as long as the money did. And that didn't give them health, guarantee them health or anything else. It's amazing how cheap people will sell their soul. You know, it's, it's, it, when I read this verse, I think of a, remember those old scales? You put uh, the produce on this side and the weights are on this side. It's like Jesus piles all the wealth of this world on one side here. Everything, houses, land, whatever is most valuable to people. He loads up the scales like this and he says, all I have to do is put one thing on this side that's going to tip the scale. What is that? He said, your soul. Your soul is worth more to God than all the things. He didn't die for things. He died for you. He died for your sins and for mine. And one soul to God is worth more. He would have come if it was just one sinner, I believe, to die in your place. If you were the only sinner on earth. He would still have paid the price because he loves you and loves me. And I'm thankful for that. So don't trade yourself out. Don't sell your soul. You know, they had to admit they'd fallen asleep. My goodness, can you imagine that? So, uh, Hans, what happened the other night? You're the soldier guarding the tomb there. I fell asleep. Really? You fell asleep? What about Ian over there? He fall asleep too? Yeah, yeah, he fell asleep too. What about Greg? Well, Greg too, yeah, he's over there, he's sleeping too. You mean all of you fell asleep? Yeah, 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 we all fell asleep. Yeah, yeah. Really? Wow. So you were asleep when the disciples came and made that ruckus, all 11 of them, and pushed that stone out of the way? Yeah, yeah, we, I didn't hear a thing, I didn't hear a thing. I was sound asleep. Oh, it's long asleep. Oh, you didn't, you didn't uh, hear when they undressed Jesus? You, you weren't there when they took his napkin and folded it up? They took their time, you see. You weren't there when they dragged his body out of the tomb and, and took off? No, no, we, we were all sound asleep. Ian too, every, everybody, the whole works. Everybody was asleep. Well, how do you know it was the disciples who took the body then? Uh, 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 mm. oh. Jingle, jingle, and rattle the money in their hand and think it was worth it. I don't care. It sounds foolish. They didn't have much time to concoct this story. And things were happening like this, and they had to come up with something quick. And they did. But the only thing that they could satisfy the people teasing them about falling asleep and stuff, they jingle that money in their pockets. Well, I, somehow it was worth it for them. Uh, their conscience, I'm sure, bothered them. They had to admit that. What a story. And so we get to verse 16, coming back to the disciples. And when the disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, and, 
And some doubted, but some doubted. So you'll always have that in a crowd, and I bet we have that today even in this small gathering in this church. You have some who will worship Jesus, some who will believe, but there's some among you who, who doubt. Things don't change much over time. They worship him, do you worship him? And in verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded to you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. I'm with you. What greater comfort can you have Jesus, see, he stayed when he, he after the resurrection, he was 40 days in this earth. He spent time with the disciples. They went out fishing. Jesus made breakfast on the shore. There were many times where Jesus appeared to them. For 40 days, he walked in faith. And this was right before he's about to send back up into heaven. And he gives them a task. He says, I want you to go and tell people about me. Tell them I rose from the dead. Tell them how to repent and, and to put their trust in me so that they can spend eternity in heaven with me and have their sins forgiven. They had a task, and you and I have the same task today. It's no different. Once we found Christ, we have to tell somebody else. And the great thing about this is there's going to be trouble. You get laughed at. I get laughed at. You get laughed at. Sometimes. Sometimes not. But you know what? The promise is, is the same for you and me. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Yeah, he went back into heaven, but what? He sent the Holy Spirit. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We baptize him in any... In the person of the Holy Spirit, he's here. And when you go to work Monday morning, he's not just here when we're in a, gathered together. He's in your car on your way to work with you. Even when you think he's not. And I've gone through things where I thought God had abandoned me. Honestly. There were times, hours, months, where I thought God had abandoned me. But I have to hit, stick with the scripture. But I don't rely on my feelings. It comes back to this, do I believe it? He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And the comfort that that brings and the joy that brings. So know that if you walk with God, there's not going to be a moment in this earth when you walk through trials. It can be a loss of a baby. It can be many things you go through, many trials in life, and yet God is with you. Don't we have a good God? Nobody else loved you that much that would die for you. Somebody said, well, how much does he love me? And he holds out his hands on the cross and says, I love you this much. Enough to die in your place. And all he's asking in return is that we repent of our sins and put our trust in him. It's not by being good that I'm going to get there. It's because Jesus died on the cross. But now I want to live for the one who died for me and rose again. And so what are you going to do with Jesus? Will you do what the soldiers did? Or will you do what the disciples and Mary Magdalene and others did? They worshipped him. They lived for him. They went out telling others about him with the presence of God with them and the mark of God on their life as well as yours. He's alive. He's alive. I talked to him this morning. I talked to him right before we started this service as well. He's alive. Don't sell your soul, chief. And so with this, I'm just... So happy he rose from the dead. I'd have the most miserable job in the world if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. I wouldn't be here this morning, I'll tell you that. But he did rise. He's alive and he's still the same God as he ever was. He's God in your tough times. He's God in your good times. Trust him. Amen. Let's pray and we'll sing a song here in closing. Father, we thank you for your plan of salvation, Lord, we couldn't have concocted such a plan. No king has ever died for a villain, and yet that's what you did for us. We're the villain, and yet you, the sinless, perfect one, sacrificed your life for us. And the only proof that that came true and you were accepted that sacrifice is that you rose from the dead and conquered death. So we thank you. And help us to remember that it's your words that to us sometimes when we need to hear it. You're telling somebody here this morning, don't be afraid. I'm with you. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your presence. Even when we don't sense it. I thank you for the promises in your word. I thank you that you never lie. Help us to believe it. 
Come what may, your promises are true. And we trust you. And thank you so much for coming back from the dead and giving us a little taste of what the resurrection is going to be like by raising a few from the dead there on your resurrection day. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the life that we have yet to look forward to in heaven with you forever. Thank you that these things were written that we might know that we have eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I love you. We love you as a body of believers, too. We say, have your way in our life. Guide us this week. Since you're risen and alive, we want to see you involved in every part of our life. We commit ourselves to you this day and the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right. I think we have a song to sing in closing. Don't we? All right. Oh, praise God. Uh, thank you, Pastor Dan. I so, uh, for bringing the word. I'm just so excited. I, I just like to read, if you permit me, I like to read here in Job, you know, many hundred years ago, Job was able to say in chapter 19, 25, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand of the latter days upon the earth. And though after my skin, Worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. So I, I just thank the Lord that I have this blessed hope. You know, I, like you said, Pastor Dan, if they bury me, worms will destroy this body. But God will give us a, a new body. He will raise us from the dead. And so it's just, just awesome. It's just the yeah, just a, an awesome God. So, so let's uh, stand and Praise him with uh, 357. Uh, low in the grave he lay, but he rose from the dead. 357. <clears throat>
drinker from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs>